I'm very glad to be able to uh, to have this program tonight with uh, with Dr. Sir. Uh, I'm going to be doing uh, for about half an hour uh, different uh, Passover customs and foods, and then I'm going to turn over to uh, to Dr. Sir, who uh, had a gourmet kitchen installed in the hotel at her own uh, at her own expense, just for the program tonight. So you're welcome. Um, so uh, I prepared a few things. Um, we're going to talk about uh, different kinds of uh, foods, different kind of um, of customs. And so let me uh, share my screen. I think I did this right. All right. Does it say uh, Pesach foods and traditions around the world? Okay, yes. great. So if that actually came up, the evening's already been a success. Okay. So let's start with the let's start with the uh, with the elephant in the room, and to spend a couple minutes explaining just the approach to uh, legumes and rice and beans and things like that, because that actually is uh, these are foods and uh, they uh, they're issues around the world. So the question is, why are beans and rice suddenly okay? The answer is, they're not suddenly okay. They've been okay for thousands of years. Uh, just for Ashkenazic Jews, because we are repressed in so many different ways uh, that we're not going to uh, go into. We decided, hmm, mujadra, that looks delicious. Nope, can't have that. You know, let's let's have uh, Manischewitz borscht instead. I mean, no disrespect to Manischewitz borscht, but if you're going to give me a choice between this and mujadra, I know what I'm picking uh, every day. Um, so let, let me explain what the, the issue is. Comets can be made on, only out of these things. This is it. Wheat, rye, barley, oats, and spelt. Nothing else ever, ever, ever can be chametz. Please, nothing can be chametz. Rice is not chametz. Lentils are not chametz. It's not that they magically transformed. It's not like the conservative movement said, hey, we're tired of this. Uh, being hummus, we're now making it okay. Because honest, if we could transform foods, it would be bacon. Just saying, there'd be a billion more Jews if we if we green lighted bacon. Honestly, that seems to be the the single biggest thing holding uh, people back from joining the uh, the Jewish people. Yeah, if we could transform not kosher into kosher, yeah, that would be awesome. In the Sephardic world, the Mizrahi world, every Jewish world, except for the Ashkenazic world, has been eating legumes, rice, beans, things like that since the beginning of Passover. Um, I, I, if someone has a question, if someone could monitor the the questions because I can't see them with my uh, screen up. Um, someone has a question so about what, corn, Rabbi. What about corn? Corn also. Uh, anything, anything that's a legume, corn, bean, rice, any of these things. Uh, Sephardic Jews have been eating forever. Now, one of the reasons they weren't, you know, corn is kind of indigenous to uh, America. So it's, but that's all okay because it's not one of these big five. There is one reason and one reason only that Ashkenazic Jews banned these things is because they can be ground up and made into things that look like chametz. And Ashkenazic Jews are obsessed with the appearance of things. That's why we have the term ma'arid ayin. You can't do something that looks inappropriate because people might think you're doing something inappropriate. So the fact is, is that if you are going to be strict on the uh, the legumes and lentils and rice, then you should not be eating anything with matzah flour either. You should not be eating those nice, delicious cakes because those look chametz stick. Again, the only reason these things were banned was because they looked like hummets. Um, but what changed really is that because Israel now is majority Sephardic or Mizrahi Jews, and Ashkenazic Jews and you know Jews from all over the world have been getting together in Israel, Ashkenazic Jews are like, that looks delicious. Can I have some? And they're like, sure. And they're like, wow, why have we been eating not deliciousness for all this year. Even Maimonides used to ridicule Ashkenazic Jews. Maimonides is like, those guys are crazy strict. If Maimonides thinks you've gone over the edge in terms of Jewish law, you got to reel it back a little bit. So um, I, 
uh, that dish of mujadra, that makes for a delicious Passover meal. I can tell you personally, the holiday goes faster. Also, if you are a vegetarian or vegan, you, you, you got to get something in your diet because you can't just live on uh, butter and matzah. I mean, you could, but you wouldn't want to. But again, it's only these five, and these are the five things that you can make uh, matzah out of. Uh, are there any questions about this right yeah, now? Yeah, Rabbi, so there's a question, um, Lisa mentioned that, I thought it was because they took, it takes more than 18 minutes to cook. Uh, no, but it doesn't change anything. Uh, we make, matzah is made out of wheat, rye, barley, oats, or spelt, uh, especially if you have gluten, uh, you know, uh, gluten sensitivities you would make it out of something out of, it's these things, if you don't turn it into matzah in 18 minutes become chametz. But if you have rice and you cook it for 12 hours in like a really a slow, like, you know, like a casserole slow cooker thing, it can't become chametz ever. Nothing ever, ever, ever can become chametz except these five things. So it doesn't matter how long, it was really with the Ashkenazi, it was appearance only. And um, Rina, was... you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Raina, your hand is up. Did you have a question? Okay, so let, let's go on. And I put it, that's it, really. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's look at uh, different traditions, which I, I thought would be uh, would be really fun to, uh, to look at. Uh, from, uh, because, uh, you know, in America, Jews tend to think, uh, people tend to think of Jews as just uh, white people. And I think that that's uh, grossly unfair in a, in a lot of ways to people of color, but it's also unfair to all Jews because it kinds of, well, anyway, I'm not going to get too far into that, but there are lots of different kinds of Jews and lots of different ways of, uh, of being Jewish. So what I uh, love here is that you have uh, Jews in Morocco and Algeria. Uh, I'll talk about the Mamuna a little later, which is which is the end of Passover, which has become very uh, popular in Israel. But as you know, Passover is a spring holiday. Uh, it is about renewal. It is about rebirth. Um, so they have a, a table is heaped with item items symbolizing luck or fertility. A lot of things with the number five. Uh, pardon me. Oh, yeah, uh, fig leaves, fish, wheat, uh, and honey uh, included. Um, again, it things that were made into matzah appropriate uh, kind of things. Uh, this one I thought was really moving about the Jews from Ethiopia, because if you think about the, the process of bringing the Jews of Ethiopia into Israel, it's called Operation Exodus. You know, and uh, that is, uh, you know, think about how much they directly relate uh, to the story, uh, same with the Jews of the uh, the former Soviet uh, Union. But one of the things they do is that each year they 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 make brand new plates uh, for earthenware, and then they break them uh, right before Passover and make new ones as literally a break from the uh, the past. Uh, they also tend to uh, they they stay away from eating anything fermented, uh, dairy wise at the time, just because they they you know, chametz is really means to ferment. Uh, it doesn't really mean to rise. Uh, it means to ferment. So they avoid uh, certain dairy things. And though what's interesting is that they do make uh, their matzah from chickpea flour because that's what they had. That's what was very um, available. And uh, some they do eat lamb. Now, this is another Ashkenazic versus Sephardic and Mizrahi thing. Ashkenazic Jews do not eat lamb at the Seder. Sephardic Jews go out of their way to eat lamb at the Seder because it was a lamb that was sacrificed, uh, you know, for, you know, at the, you know, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and, you know, the, the roast lamb that was the uh, the Korban Pesach, the Paschal offering, and that's what they did in the temple. Ashkenazic Jews said, if we can't do something 100% the way things were in the temple, we're not doing it at all. Sephardic Jews say, let's do as much as we possibly can. They're both legit philosophical approaches, but that's all they are. They are philosophical approaches. 
you know, and that's where some of the uh, the difference is. But I thought that it was just so moving. Um, here, let's go to the next. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, the African American Jewish community, and it's a uh, haroset that I thought was uh, was really powerful. Um, and it says um, on the the seder plate, there is a blending of uh, African American foods and Jewish symbolism. So there's the haroset with cocoa figs, pecans, and sugar cane. Uh, which is where the brown sugar, molasses, and rum were derived, and they were all prominent uh, slave, crops, slave crops of the transatlantic slave trade. And so that was very powerful that it's a reminder of the dual slaveries, the slavery from Egypt, but also the, uh, the American slavery as well. So I thought that it was important to, uh, to bring that in as well, because there is a, a sizable African-American Jewish community um, the majority uh, Jewish community has been very slow to open its arms to that community. Things are, uh, things are getting uh, a little better. If you are interested, there's a marvelous website called Bechol Lashon, uh, B-E-C-H-O-L, and then Lashon, uh, I think it's L-E-S-H-O-N uh, in all languages. But it is uh, a, a treasure trove of materials about uh, Jews of color and customs and how to uh, how to deal with things. I mean, the fact is, is that if we're going to talk about slavery in Egypt, but we ignore racism today, uh, we are absolutely violating what Rabbi Heschel said. Uh, he, uh, at the conference that Dr. Heschel and Dr. King met, uh, Dr. Heschel said that the first meeting on racism was between Moses and Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a, uh, a very astute. Uh, this was in 1963. This was two years before Selma. That's where uh, that's really where they met and became friends. Um, in Afghanistan um, and in other places in the region, uh, they take scallions and they kind of uh, they they smack each other a little bit, uh, just like uh, <laughs> the, uh, the the taskmasters uh, whipped the slaves. Um, you know, th this is the uh, the victim parodying the um, the oppressor. If it was the oppressor doing this, like, hey, let's pretend we're the Jews and whip each that would be that would be really bad. So you have to get a sense that uh, context is uh, is important as well. Um, in Spain, um, th this was a fun one. Uh, and it's, it's easy to do. Uh, this one isn't food related necessarily, uh, but they do a sort of a version of duck, duck, ju duck, duck, goose <laughs> is that uh, they walk around and they tap a person, you know, on the head and that person then has to go. Um, the idea here is really to do things kind of weird and different. So people ask more questions like, why are you tapping me in the head? But just a, uh, a fun thing. Uh, I see the, are there some questions coming up? Anything I should answer? Okay, now this one was really funny. Uh, you know, they talk about Haroset being like the bricks. Uh, and actually my, uh, my video that I'm making for Passover is about Maror and Haroset. Uh, Haroset is from the same word as clay, which is a cheres, um, but it really means a paste. And the Jews in Gibraltar, they take bricks and they grind, uh, they grind up brick dust and they put it in the Haroset. They mix in a little bit, so you know to actually put it in. And they tell you, and the and the, the person who was telling the story said that like one of the memories is like finding like little bits of brick in their teeth uh, when they were were doing. I'm not suggesting this recipe, though. I have to tell you, if I were to make haroset from scratch, that would probably wind up what it would be like. Um, I'm sure, like, oh wait, you're supposed to take the nuts out of the shell. Oh, okay. Um, but I, I thought that that was just a, I thought that was just so funny. And this has been going on uh, for, uh, for a while. Uh, in Syria, uh, what they did is they would take the matzah and they would break it into the shapes of different Jewish letters. I mean, of different Hebrew letters. And that would actually be a fun thing to do with, uh, with kids. You know, is just, you know, give them a piece of matzah and, you know, have them make different words and different shapes, you know, and and, uh, and things, I mean, it's way better than eating it. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, 
you know, just a, you know, kind of a, a fun thing to do. But if you think about that, the world was created out of letters, according to Kabbalah. This also has a, you know, a certain mystical um, uh, value to it as well. Um, these uh, look like something you do for Hanukkah, but these are uh, fried donuts from Spain that mm -hmm. are made out of uh, matzah, egg, cinnamon, brown sugar, and cardamom. And then you cover them with rose water and pistachios. Um, and and you know why they do it because it's delicious that's why they do it but i think what happens is and one of the reasons i wanted to bring this is that we tend to get very narrowly focused in the flavor profile on passover <coughs> and it might be just because people like certain traditional things but you can be way more expansive and creative if you like the cuisine of other countries everything can be made for pesach you can just do some clever substitutions. Uh, this is uh, a Harak, Iraqi halak, which is their haroset. And instead of having uh, apples or pears or things like that, they use date syrup, walnuts, and lemon juice. And, uh, and that's it. And they just sort of uh, mush it all together. You can either do it very finely or, um, or just kind of chunky. But you know, expand the idea of what the haroset can be. It, it doesn't have to be the apples, nuts, wine, and cinnamon. Again, you know, that might be like a very old school, you know, like for me, like I always need some of that just because that's how we've done it. But think about just the possibilities. It's always something uh, fruity and sweet, something nuts, and something just to kind of tie it, um, tie it together. So, and you can, you can tailor, honestly, the harosa depending on what your main dish is. You know, so if you're, you know, if you're in not? Israel, you can go buy Ben and Jerry's Harotzed ice cream for Passover. That's awesome. Really? It's got apples, wow. and walnuts, and and uh, cinnamon. It's really yummy. <laughs> to some extent, I'm wondering if the resistance to trying things new is the fact that the foods that we're so used to eating represent comfort foods for us because they represent what we've been having since we're children. And the idea of giving them up for something new requires us to change that. Right. And well, that's why I'm not suggesting you give it up. I would suggest you just adding possibilities. Yeah, but there, along with that comes the guilt. Oh my God, your harosis is so much better than my Zadie's was. Right, my absolutely. Like but what would the holiday be without the guilt? I mean, I think that this is important <laughs> as, as, as well. Um, but you know, one of the things I think we need to think about, and I, you know, if we think about that, leaving Egypt means leaving narrowness and expanding, is it's a big Jewish world. There are not a lot of Jews, but there are so many different aspects of Jewish culture that I think that there's a power in expanding. But also, if you eat the foods of another culture, maybe you start learning about it, and maybe it connects you, and maybe it broadens your connection. I I, I love the fact that. You know, I can do something that an Iraqi Jew would make, and all of a sudden, wait, maybe there's more of a connection than I thought, as opposed to uh, those those people uh, over there. Um, these are uh, this is from a town in Poland where they reenact the uh, the crossing of the sea, and uh, they name the towns that they, they kind of had to flee from. You know, uh, as they're uh, they do it, they do it, and they're just uh, very grateful. But um, you know that you can adapt. You know, think about you know where was an oppressive place for you, and how did you uh, leave it? Um, in uh, a lot of the Sephardic communities, they uh, they dress in costume, and they uh, they they go all out, including the adults. And then you can make whatever the uh, whatever the dish is. But um, you know they would uh, they would put the matzah in the bag, throw it over the shoulder, and you know you can take turns being uh, Moses. Uh, I love this one. The Jews in India are very strict in inspecting the rice for any hummus whatsoever. Like they are meticulous about their Passover rice, and I, and uh, clearly this is the uh, the community in India has been around for a couple thousand years. They've been there for a very long time. And this is what they have been, um, what they have been doing, and uh, because rice is such a staple of the diet. Uh, but again, it's not chametz. Rice is not chametz. 
uh, uh, some people have the uh, custom of actually cooking with the wine from uh, Elijah's cup. Anything uh, that he didn't drink, uh, they then put it into a, uh, a dish. You know, just, um, I, I don't think anymore I have to explain why we have wine at the Seder, especially during this last year of COVID. <laughs> like, yeah, I think people have been making Seder every night in a way. <laughs> Uh, these are the Jews of, uh, of Guatemala City. Uh, most of them are uh, Jews by choice. Um, and what I just love is that they just, uh, they, they have to, they, there, there's not a, um, a lot of kosher food produced in, uh, in Guatemala City. So what I love here is I normally don't encourage people to buy processed products, but they are so proud of the mixes they were able to get from Canada the matzo ball mixes and the cake mixes and all that, you know, and I, I just loved like how seriously they're taking uh, things. Um, and these uh, converts would never have uh, occurred if there was a ban on reform and uh, conservative conversion in general. Um, I don't wanna to go too far afield on that, but there would be a lot of people in the world who not, would not be part of the Jewish people. And if, and if you, if you wanna say that these people who are doing everything possible in a place where there are very few Jews and it's very expensive and very difficult that they're not doing their share. Well, I had a, my, uh, my Bubby had a very gentle phrase. Uh, it was, uh, I think she was talking about her sweater, Kashmir Tuchas. Oh, oh, that was Kishmir Tuchas, yeah. Anyway, so let's talk for a moment, talk about the Maimuna. This has become one of the great, you know, Passover is a seven day holiday in Israel. Um, in America, it's actually, it's also a seven day holiday because the first two days are the same day and the last two days are the same day. Um, but in Israel, it's over on the, uh, it, it, the, the day after the seventh day, it's over. And they have a, a tradition now in Israel. It began with the uh, Moroccan Jews of having the mamuna of as much chametz as you could possibly eat and as many sweet uh, things as you could um, possibly have. Um, and it's just this wonderful way. It's become very popular in Israel to, to celebrate the Mamuna. People who don't even keep Passover keep the Mamuna. <laughs> They're very, like people, you know, like your Tel Aviv hipster who's eating, you know, you know, burgers, all, the Mamuna, because that's become, and it's just wonderful. This never would have happened uh, a number of years ago. Moroccan Jews were actually considered at a very low level in Israel. Ashkenazic Jews were the elite, and then you had, you know, kind of going down, and the only the only people lower than the Moroccans were the Gruzinin, the ones from Soviet Georgia. Those were the lowest of the low. I, uh, when Ruth and I were married, our apartment building were mostly Moroccan and Gruzinim, and we just kind of bonded because we, as the Americans, we they, they you know, no one had the time of day for us in that uh, particular neighborhood. But there's now much more um, acceptance. So what's happening is that. The more the foods are being accepted, the more the people are. You would kind of hope it would go the other direction, but that's kind of not really, uh, really what's happening. Uh, but food is, uh, especially we get Jews and food together and you have lots of deliciousness. So um, these are just different things that uh, the Jewish community is, um, is doing around the world. What I would suggest is finding ways to bring at least one creative dish into your Seder, and uh, Dr. Sir is going to be talking about some of these in a moment. But again, the idea of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, is the word Metzar is narrow. And we leave Egypt to, the, the purpose of leaving Egypt wasn't just so we could be narrow-minded somewhere else, <laughs> right? It was to be expansive and, um, and to be open. So uh, I thought these were uh, were kind of fun and um, and interesting. I think that was my last slide. And um, here, let me take this off. Uh, are there any uh, any questions for me about any of this? 
Again, everything can be adapted. I think, Alan, you have a question? I just wondered, because Israel is such a conglomeration of foods from all over the world, there's not one real Israeli type of food. It's a mix of everything. Is that Correct. why the food becomes the first thing and then the people are second because they're now incorporating it into the Israeli cuisine? Um, I think that's part of it. I think people will take a chance on going to a different kind of restaurant before they will take a chance on having a conversation. And I think that these kind of restaurants and places became just sort of a natural to, to kind of ease in. But like if you had a like a Moroccan neighbor, you wouldn't necessarily talk to that person. But if you saw a restaurant that was serving Moroccan food and say, oh, this looks interesting. And wow, you know, look, there are Moroccans in there. And then you just naturally, you know, you have a Lachaim together and then pretty soon it's uh, connecting. There really is no such thing as official Jewish food, right? Everything has been adapted from whatever it is. You know, what, what makes it Jewish is the thought process behind it. It's whether, you know, the, you know, a lot of a lot of different aspects, but food in, I mean, Israel, I mean, I don't care the high tech part, their food is awesome. And it is just awesome. I have dreams of doing a tour of Israel that it's just hummus places <laughs> from from starting in Haifa to Abu Bakr, or making our way down to Arbus. I've seen all the broken pieces of rubble I ever need to see in my life. I don't need to see this used to be there and that used to be there. And, and King Tut used to take his bubby on vacation. Like, I don't care. I, I mean, I shouldn't say that when we plan the next trip, I'll tell you how wonderful and interesting it is. But I personally don't need to see another pile of rubble. What I need is hummus with preserved lemon. lemon and and falafel, the wine uh, also. We can do hummus and wineries. Yes. Which Absolutely. we are, speaking of that, we will be doing a class on Israeli wine. I just got an email from the person presenting it today. Yeah, so you can call it from Jewish whining to Israeli wineries. Yeah. Mm, perfect. Yeah, no, okay, so I've, I've talked enough, Dr. Sir, it's all you. All right, thank you. So interestingly enough, um, and of course, Rabbi Bergman and I both found some of the same kinds of amazing places and, and recipes and I, customs. And I started looking for one or two things and then went down the rabbit hole of Google and all recipes and Epicurious and Jewish uh, genealogical recipe sites. There's a lot of information out there. And put it together onto what's called a Padlet. And this is an interactive map. I will share the link with you in the chat when we're done and you have full access to this and all of its recipes. And I thought we would start actually with a little known part of America in terms of its Jewish community, our frozen chosen over here in Alaska. Mm. Uh, the Jewish community in Alaska is very small and it, they tried to take all of the best parts of everything that they remembered um, about Passover with what they have locally. And so we have a, one of the 5,000 chosen frozen and they make a beautiful um, kind of fish mold, I guess would be the best way to put it. It's made in a butt pan. So I guess if you if you like play, it's sort of like a gefilte fish, but baked in a butt pan. Sounds really good yeah. if you like fish. Um, but I thought I would share this as well. And it's just interesting because they make it um, from what they have, which is fish. Now, we talked a little bit before, Rabbi Bergman, about why kidney oat in certain places, why did they eat rice and they eat potatoes. In a sense, you make what you have. <clears throat> so the Jews of Spain didn't know from a potato. And the Jews of Eastern Europe didn't know lentils. And so by the time they were able to see all of these cultures integrating, their customs had already been sort of cemented. Not like corrosive, but uh, but definitely cemented. Um, I want to share with you as well. There is a Cuban chicken soup that looks awesome. Cuban chicken soup because um, it combines the the different pieces of Cuban cuisine. And having grown up in South Florida, um, Cuban cuisine was definitely um, 
high on my list. And what makes it interesting and different is nutmeg, allspice, bay leaves, um, and malangas, okay, along with bijol powder, cilantro, squash, bok choy, lime, and they do give some malangas or yuca. And if you don't have yuca, you can use potatoes. And bijol powder is saffron. So these are things that, um, that we may want to incorporate into our already traditional recipe. Say, so let's give it a little bit of extra. Let's bring some of those other cultures to our table. I thought that was very cool. There is a Jewish community in Argentina, um, which primarily came from Tunisia. And so the recipes there for their knedlach, um, cumin, pepper, and parsley. So we can see how from the harosa to the chicken soup, um, the recipes really do change depending on what was common in terms of produce, but also the regions in which they are kind of bringing their recipes from one place to another. The recipes really travel um, just as much as the people do, and they change a little bit over time. There's also braised vegetables and lamb, like Rabbi Bergman said, the um, Sephardi communities, including the Tunisian now Argentinian community will eat lamb on Passover for Seder. Um, this recipe is braised, roast it, but you can braise it <clears throat> and include things like artichoke and orange blossom water and uh, harissa, which is spicy and delicious. And uh, also includes fava beans and peas. These are um, traditional foods that all have symbolic kind of representation of life and springtime and to serve it hot with matzah or rice. There's also a yummy chocolate mousse recipe here for those of you who don't consider chocolate to be a kidney oat bean. I always wondered if, if cocoa beans and coffee beans, right? Why wouldn't they be considered kidney oat? But then I stopped asking the question because I did not want to give up chocolate or coffee. Uh, both excellent yummy foods. So we have our um, Argentina, and I'm gonna shift all the way over, okay. Um, good. So here we have Scotland. These look amazing. Cinnamon balls. Scottish Jewish community is not very large, but they bring together all of the um, classic Scottish baking with Passover requirements and they look absolutely delicious. They're sort of like a meringue with almonds and powdered sugar. And I honestly, I have not made it, but I really plan to as soon as I have a kitchen back. Um, they really look yummy. So the, uh, the comments were really good. And if you like cinnamon and you like cake, and cookies and meringues, and probably better than the canned Manischewitz macaroons. No matter how many kinds of different flavors they come up with, they still all taste exactly the same. I don't know, I can't tell the difference between a red velvet uh, macaroon and a chocolate chip macaroon. So, so we do have this here. I'm just kind of giving you a uh, tour through my, my map. We talked a little bit about the Indian Jewish community. We also have um, a Cochin coriander cumin chicken, which looked really good. Uh, so you'll be able to find these recipes as well as oh, we have in Mumbai rice flour crepes that supposedly taste just like regular ones and look a lot like my um, gluten-free crepe recipe. So let's will you I'm, open that one. Sure. So Indian, these are polis, I think, is that how you pronounce it? And um, gluten-free, dairy-free. This is a traditional recipe of the B'nai Yisrael, the Indian Jewish community, that they make usually during the week of Passover. So not for Seder, but definitely during the week and filled with all sorts of things. And um, 
They look delicious. Looks like it takes a little bit of a learning curve to make, but um, they look really good. And I think I will be making these too. So there's lots of directions here as well for how to serve them, what kind of pan to use. Um, they also use what in India is called shira, and what in Israel and throughout the Middle East is called silan, and that would be date syrup, um, which you can get at the Grove, which is what One Stop was. You can get it at Babylon. I'm sure you can get it at other Middle Eastern markets as well. And they look really good. So come back and visit friends down here in Yemen. Now, this was really interesting to me because dukkha is a spice mixture that is mentioned in the Talmud. And in the Talmud, it is often a Babylonian spice and spice mixture, and it is often mixed with flour. And so the question is whether you could use it on what you had to do with it. Is it a food substance? Can you eat it on your own? Do you have to get rid of it? Is it what's called chametz gamor? Like, does it really chametz or is it just a little chametz? And so the dukkha is a, a combination of these spices, which in Yemen, the community uses dates, an apple, chopped nuts, sweet wine, matzah meal instead of the flour, sesame seeds, ginger, cinnamon, and cayenne. Mm. And all of these get mixed together and are called dukkha, which is another way that they refer to as the Yemenite haroset. And um, I think I might be doing a haroted bar this year with a whole bunch of different options. And then this is definitely going to be on my list. Interestingly though, in places like Iraq, sorry, fine, we're in Syria and here we go, Persian haroset. Um, so we have two different recipes here from Tehran, one for flourless almond cookies with cardamom that look amazing, um, and one for a, again, a haroset. Again, keeping in mind, this is a Persian haroset that ended up in Mexico but I put it where it started. And this whole story about a Persian feast from Iran with rice dishes and candied orange peel and sour cherries and so forth. But the karoset made with pear, apple, banana, dates, walnuts, pecans, and pistachios. Mm. And um, it sounds really yummy. I don't know if I would add the banana, but I do like all of the other things. And, uh, and I think, again, it's, it's based on what you have and um, the, you know, this idea of um, using the resources you have around you and adapting them. So the question, do I have that recipe? Possibly, I think I do. I have a lot of recipes from Syria and a Syrian allspice. Mm. Just sort of uh, clicking around Venice. Who knew? But the, the Italian Jewish community has these amazing desserts, but also they use a fried artichoke heart for carpas. And we tend to do artichokes for carpas because you can dip them but I might actually try this, this recipe. And I am looking for the one that, you, that, uh, that Ruby asked about. I know it's in here somewhere. We've got Greeks, uh, Greek style leek patties. We have, um, there's our almond cookies. Okay, so with cherry preserves, like those don't look like Passover cookies. Those look really good. Rolling. They also look a little labor intensive, but I think it'll still be okay. And then for cherry, lots of 
Melissa, so you were mentioning about the artichokes. Mm -hmm. So for those yes. of you who traveled to Rome with me this past summer, you remember that our tour guide talked a lot about fried artichokes. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of the um, Roman and the Jewish Roman oh. cuisine. And um, so talking about using what is local, mm -hmm. uh, that is something that she talked a lot about in the special recipes. Right. And here's what they look like. These are our Roman, uh, okay, I cannot pronounce it, but it's basically artichokes, lemon, oil, and salt. It's simple. So that's here. And again, I'm gonna share this with you. So there's no need to remember, oh, where did that one come from? And if I find more cool recipes, I will add them because why not? We have Turkish recipes. Okay, with a nice story. This is a traditional, not only in, um, in Turkey, but throughout the um, Sephardi community, it's called the Mina, okay? The, the layered pie of matzah with meat and spices and vegetables or matzah with cheese and vegetables and spices. So two different um, versions. The traditional Italian one is meat. The traditional one in other places like Greece and, um, and Turkey is dairy. So just tells you again, what your community is used to eating. Okay, um, matzo meal, here's a mina, a spinach mina. Okay, sweet matzo fritters. This is the, um, the little cookie kind of round things that look like teglach, but they're made out of matzo meal. For those of you who don't know what tegla is, anybody? Tegla are those deep fried balls covered in honey for Rosh Hashanah that are delicious and I refuse to make them because they take forever. And there's also a similar Italian recipe that a friend of mine makes. And I said, oh, that's tegla. And she says, no, it's this, but we all have similar recipes. So back here, check out Morocco. Okay, Moroccan harosset balls. So in Morocco, in addition to having a, an amazing post-Passover celebration, they make their harosset into these little balls, um, sort of like truffles, but harosset truffles. And they are molded. They're made out of dates, raisins, and walnuts. And after you mix it all together, you basically mold it into little balls and put it in the fridge until Seder and everybody gets their own portion. So there's nobody hogging all of the haroset to put on their breakfast, uh, their breakfast matzah, but, uh, but there's definitely um, a nice amount there. So not quite sure how you would dip maror into a haroset ball, but I'm sure they figure it out. As I'm going through here, other questions as we're uh, traveling through, through the world here. There's our Gibraltar. So this is actually rather interesting. We look at the communities around the world, right? So Calcutta had a sizable Jewish community, okay? And Here's a recipe with a video, it's awesome. Um, so you can go back and watch that too, about their community, but also some of the recipes and what life was like for a Jewish family in Calcutta. They had a chauffeur and they had two kitchens and the, the quality of life, we're talking about very high income by comparison to the community around them, okay? But at the same time, the community had, you know, obviously a lot of challenges. So definitely some, this baji, which is a fried potato dish with onions and spices, looks great both for Passover and for Hanukkah. And as we know, the Jews of India started preparing for Passover on Hanukkah, like my mother-in-law in Chicago. So, um, so maybe they were doing potato year round. I don't know, but this does look really yummy. 
and could also qualify for karpas because it is a fruit of the earth. Anything that, uh, that we say ore priya adama on can be used for karpas. So one of the things that we do in our house is we, um, we have a whole table of vegetables and dips and that way nobody's too hungry to participate in the Seder. So I may be trying a bunch of these different recipes for our Seder, okay? And let's see what else, so many. This is our, our I had to put a classic um, Erkechel, had to be here because it was really hard to find a recipe. Um, so if you're looking to make a Kechel, here's our recipe from somewhere in the former Soviet Union. Not exactly sure, but, uh, but this seems to be a traditional recipe of basically egg, potato starch, sugar, salt, and oil. So it's uh, a little tastier than matzah. And if you're making your own matzah, which I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. If you're gonna make your own matzah, which is definitely doable, um, you need a timer, very important. The, the rabbis of the Talmud actually worried that the women would be so focused on making their matzah look pretty and putting it in different shapes that it would take more than 18 minutes. And so they forbade matzah being baked in shapes, but you can break it into shapes in Syria. You just can't bake it in the shapes. So I actually make my own gluten-free oat matzah because the oat matzah you buy for the Seder um, a is really expensive and B um, doesn't actually taste as good as the box it comes in. So I make my own and it's a really interesting process that I, I did for the first time two years ago and it comes out rather tasty. So it is basically oat flour and water. That's it. You mix the ingredients together and you hold, you kind of keep kneading them together for as long as it takes. You have to keep them moving before you bake them. Once you had it flat, you have to set your timer. So um, yes, I will be happy to post my recipe on here. I'll put it under Michigan so you'll, you'll find it. And I will share this and then we can just open up for some questions and conversation. I had a lot of fun searching for these different awesome recipes. I figured it'd be more fun to look at them and figure out which ones you might wanna make than to watch me chop apples in my non-kitchen. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the Padlet link here in the chat. Is questions for me or for Rabbi Bergman? So you can click on the Padlet now and another window will open so mm -hmm. that when you close your Zoom, you will not lose the Padlet. So you can click on the Padlet, it'll open another window and then it will stay open after you close your Zoom. Hmm. You can minimize it so you can see mm -hmm. what's going on. Charm, you can also email me later and I will send it to you if you can't find it. Thanks. A dinosaur here. You know, my curiosity, what do you, you, where do you get oat flour? So I buy um, Bob's Red Mill certified gluten-free oat flour. Okay. And it's already been checked multiple times, just like I do with my rice and my quinoa and my lentils and everything else. I check it before Passover to make sure that there's nothing hiding in it. Um, I would know because I would get very sick, but um but I always double check everything. Yeah, because when I looked into matzo recipes, that ice called for all purpose flour, which mm -hmm. you can't really use. Well, you can, because that's what matzo is made out of. Mm -hmm. But usually what they do to make matzo is they use a uh, shmora matzo is made with wheat that's been watched from the time it was planted, okay. harvested. And so it's a special flour, but I don't know, Rabbi Bergman, maybe you want to jump in on this one. My understanding is as long as you're 
you've checked it and it's flour and you set the timer, it's okay. It, it absolutely is. Uh, Shmora has become a, a part of uh, a level of obsessiveness that most Jews didn't uh, get that involved in until uh, relatively recently, except for a few. Shmura matzah is not more kosher than any other kosher certified matzah. There are people who like it because it's kind of more rustic. Uh, mm -hmm. But once the once the 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 flour, I mean, the wheat has been ground. It's and baked appropriately. There's nothing that there is is, is chometz. Um, they, they're just what has happened is that certain groups who are had different customs were much stricter have kind of said our way actually is the uh, the right way. For example, like glot kosher, uh, Jews in New York for the for the most part, Orthodox Jews don't eat glot kosher. Glot is specific to certain Orthodox groups. It doesn't mean super kosher. You know, people tell me that, you know, they had glot kosher cheese. I'm like, yuck, because glot refers to the smoothness of the lung of the cow. That's all it means. It's just, that glot means smooth. It doesn't mean super. You know, there's a word for it. there's mehadrin. You know, I try to do as much as possible, but but glot. Yeah. So a lot there a lot of Orthodox Jews will not eat glot because they think it's not a not an appropriate thing. So shmura, I mean, it can be, you know, it, you know, it's kind of rustic and you know, more whole wheat, but the cost of it is so high that if you tell a family that the only way they can really keep Pesach is by investing hundreds of dollars in matzah, <laughs> I I I. I'm not sure um, that that's the, uh, the the way to go. It really, it just, it doesn't, it's not any more kosher than the uh, box of strites that you you get in the supermarket. Thanks. You just might like the old school look because it's more rustic, but if you're looking what's more kosher, it, absolutely not. Okay. I just thought it might be kind of fun to do this year. If, why not? It, like you got the people have, you know, kind of the time and then this way you can make it to your, your you know, the, uh, the, the original matzo was very soft, actually, because if you bake it quickly and it comes out, it's, it's nice and soft there. There's one reason is just because you can't box it and mass produce it when it's all nice and soft, mm. but it's much more like a lavash or a wrap than it ever was. <laughs> you know this and the yemenite juice i mean that's it's so good i've oh had yemenite before i was gluten-free we actually um my husband's cousin's husband is sfardi and we had really good soft matzah for one theater it was lovely um oh. but i think we have to get past the uh, the misunderstanding that the matzah is hard because they had no time. They had plenty of time. They just chose to go around collecting gold and, you know, making <laughs> a seder. Um, it's not that it didn't have time to rise. It's that it was poor man thread, which was made without any extra embellishments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was... Um... Can, can, you can you clarify that? Some, some more? Sure. So lechem oni, um, which is just a very poor bread, <clears throat> is the bread, we call it the bread of affliction, right? Right. So it is a, a bread that is very simple. It is flour and water. There's no salt. There's no extra ingredients. There's no baking powder. It's just flour and water baked as a simple cake. Um, if you go back to the, the text of the, the Exodus, you'll see that they went around and collected gold and they sacrificed a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and sat down for a meal and then left in the morning. So the idea that it didn't have time to rise um, doesn't quite fit with the rest of the narrative. So we go from this flat, flavorless bread, really. Um, and then as we move from Passover to Shavuot, we get to the idea of these rich halot, these rich showbreads that we have for Shavuot. So we kind of move from poor to, to rich as we go from slavery to freedom in the land of Israel. So where did the 18 minutes from the time of mixture to baking to coming out come from? And if, if that's simply an interpretation, 
Why couldn't you eat pita bread? So pita actually has more ingredients uh, usually. Um, the the um, 18 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi, comes from the uh, Talmud where they're discussing what is leavening and how long would it be before the flour and water mixture would become something other than flour and water at what point it would become leaven if i am not mistaken right. exactly you don't they just wanted to make sure that the dough itself didn't rise you know that that was really the issue that's what you have with uh with uh, pita but making a uh, flatbread part of it is look just there's an ashkenazic fear of happiness <laughs> <laughs> like there, there just is, and we have to brace it. We do not believe that it's a celebration without suffering. And, you know, like you call this Pesach, it's all delicious. And like, it's a holiday. It's a holiday. We say Chag Sameach. We say Good Yontif. We have such a fear of joy that that's actually, I think, a bigger issue that we have to look at. We we are the Kanino Hora people. Oh, this this was so nice. Kanino Hora. Or, uh, or, or shh, don't tell anyone, you know, it's, you know, it's my favorite so holiday. Pardon me? Passover is my favorite holiday. Yeah, it's supposed to be nice. It's supposed to be delicious. You know, we are free. That's why they added the wine and the set. Like it's to make it, <laughs> you know, to make it nicer. And we're like, nah, no, nah, let's not do that. You know what they also didn't say? Talk for eight hours at your Seder. No, they didn't. They said, have a long festive meal. It didn't say, and then gulp down the food and did, 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 did. You know, it's our, our seders at home are much shorter. The, if people tell me how long theirs were, I'm like, good for you. Good for you. Um, you know, you got eight days to tell the story. You don't have to do the whole thing in one night. Enjoy it. You're, you're actually allowed. You're allowed to have deliciousness. In fact, that it's a holiday. Did I mention it's a holiday? Yeah, it's a holiday. Last year, we actually, or two years ago, we got the graphic novel Hagadot, the brand new ones that came out with from Corin, and we left them out on the dining room table. And throughout a week or two before Passover, the kids kept saying, oh, can I sit? Can I read that? And so they spent the weeks before Pesach learning the Haggadah because it was a comic book. <laughs> I'm happy to share that link too. If you, if anyone's interested, I bet you could still get it in time. I highly recommend it. It's great. Okay. Well, well, thank you. I think it's it's eight thirty now, and again, uh, Doctor Sir has all the recipes, and I just wanted to give you sort of like a philosophy of the uh, of the food and to think about it, and uh, lots more stuff coming up. And Jody, thank you so much for making sure it always works and joining in everything and gets promoted and uh, and everything. And uh, to my colleague Doctor Sir, of course, too, with uh, just making sure it just just what you've seen this is what uh th this is what the team does every day so it's um it's a good thing so uh have a uh is this in pesach and uh the the uh the padlet will be available uh i think you'll be able I will to stay uh, on for a minute or two so if anyone wants yeah. help clicking on the padlet so that you can save it just stay on and i will walk you through it yeah and Thank all you. the recipes are right there uh, if you just click on the padlet Thank you. Is that All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Very good. Everyone, there's a lot Thank going you. on, especially with Pesach. The um, recent uh, message that went out on Sunday has information about everything going on. And then next Sunday, it will also include um, more programming with regards to preparing for Pesach. And this week, join Rabbi Bergman for Peer Care Vote on Friday at 11 a.m. And then on Sunday, I'm sorry, on Saturday um, at Sofo Yoga at 11 a.m., he will also be focusing on Pesach. So please join us for these upcoming programs. Um, check Facebook. It's always posted there on our website. And as you know, the weekly email as well as the Shabbat message. And um, so we can go about this a couple of ways. What we usually do, Melissa, when we have classes and there's um, handouts, what I ask is that people send me a direct email. And then what I will do is I will email you all of the information that Melissa shared. So Melissa is going to email me all of the links with a just very brief one line. This is what it is. And then when you email me, I will copy it and send it directly to you. So you have everything in one folder. I mean, sorry, one message. 
And then if you are, if you have a system in your email, okay, I admit it, I do, um, have that says Passover or holidays, you just put it in that folder when you're done. And then next year you can click on it or you can email me and say, Jody, do you have that email with all of the links? <laughs> <laughs> is the Padlet going to be up indefinitely or is mm -hmm. that? Oh, yep. okay, good. Okay. And actually, if you click on it from the chat, it will open up in another tab. And then you can save it from there. You can click uh, the star on your bookmarks key. Uh, so Joe, thing I can't think of the word right now. The bookmarks bar. <laughs> you bookmark on your serve on the on the search bar under the search bar. There's another line, and if you click on the star, it will automatically be underneath your search bar. So it will be there forever until you delete it. Melissa, or if I you have, don't know how to delete it. Mm -hmm. If I have a Padlet account, will it go into my Padlets? You can add it to your Padlet account. Yeah. I you just have to like heart, you you put a heart on it and you save it. Okay. But I, the answer about the gluten free matza it is on West Bloomfield, Michigan. What do you mean it's on West Bloomfield? Michigan? On the map. Oh, it's on the map. Okay, oh, thank you. I added it to the map. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Melissa yes. How, how do you get? You. How do you get that nice filter? Um, I updated Zoom. It is called Blur. It is so that you cannot see the disaster behind me. Oh, we're still recording, right? <laughs> that is that's really a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. I got to update my Zoom. Yes, you have to.